Hi everyone, season's greeting from Base Leg Aviation. Merry Christmas Eve for those of you who celebrate Christmas. We woke up to nine degrees this morning in Atlanta. At least the sun was shining, but it's still cold. I don't envy those of you around the rest of the country that are uh, sitting inside trying to avoid the blizzard that looks like uh, is happening around some parts of the country. So what better thing to do than watch some videos from Base Leg Aviation. So we got a couple topics this morning. First, we'd like to show you some pictures over here, a little bit of a hummingbird update. Uh, managed to get some things painted. The doors, they're actually coming out quite pretty. We've got some stripes on them. I'm in the process right now of taping the fuselage, and uh, but it's too cold to paint. So again, we thought we'd uh, do some video for you today. We actually have had a couple of requests for some topics. One has to do with uh, rod end bearings and fire extinguishers. So let's talk about rod end bearings. So rod end bearings come in all different kinds of styles and shapes, okay? We have what, uh, here's a female rod end bearing. So that typically goes on a threaded rod, hence the name rod end bearing. Here's a male rod end bearing. Again, all different sizes. You can see this is a dash five bolt. This would take a 3 16 a dash three bolt. Okay, so these things typically go on the end of something, whether it's a control rod. These that I showed you here actually will go inside a tube. You can weld this or rivet it inside the tube and then make yourself, you know, whatever the length of the tube needs to be. And some of the RVs, we've got uh, five or six foot push rod tubes of two, three inches in diameter to move the elevator up and down. But there's a rod end bearing at each end. So the rod end bearing uh makes it very easy to attach something to a moving part and the way we do that is what causes some concern so i don't know if you can see this real closely but this rod end bearing has the bearing inside that actually rotates and maybe i can use the big one here so you can see it a little bit better i'm going to hold this and you'll see that this rod end bearing rotates around the bearing on the inside and pivots certain degrees but my finger holds it tight, it doesn't turn, right? That piece is staying still. So therein lies some clues as to how we're gonna mount a rod end bearing. The objective is to actually keep this piece sandwiched between the bolt and whatever piece that you're attaching it to. And the way we do that is use a regular AN bolt, okay? This would go through the rod end and then to whatever piece we might be attaching it to, and we'll just use this as an example, you could in some places have another rod end, but typically it's a control arm, maybe a bell crank that goes down there. So what we wanna do is on one end of the rod end, opposite from where the piece is gonna be, we wanna prevent this failure. If this rod end bearing should ever break apart, we wanna make certain we keep this uh, linked to whatever we're trying to control. So you'll use a large diameter washer on the outside. And then one of the things I'm going to show you here, remember I told you how it pivoted? With this large diameter washer there, if we pivot this rod end bearing, you can see that washer makes contact there with the rod end bearing itself. So what we're going to do is use a little washer here. It's the same diameter as the bolt, okay? And a small, it's not a typical AN washer, it's MS, and I'll have to look up that part number. But that goes right here. And then you can see now we get all the movement that we want on this rod end bearing. The objective being that this moves and pivots and the large area washer or whatever we're connecting to does not contact the rod end bearing. So that goes on. And then on the opposite side, we'll use another small washer then connect whatever we're connecting, whether it's a rod end bearing or the control arm, perhaps your throttle mixture. And so that goes on, and then typically you'll put a washer on, and then you can use a heat nut if it's in the engine compartment. I always recommend using heat nuts in the engine compartments like this, or we could use a fiber nut if it's on an aileron elevator, some other control surface that's not in the engine compartment. Now, the idea here is to, when you attach this nut to this bolt, is yes, you go ahead and tighten that down all the way so that this bolt is tight and there's no slop on this rod end bearing. Remember, just like I showed you here, we want that rod end bearing captured with the bolt. 
and whatever piece of material is in there so it's tight. Okay, We're able to use a locking nut on this side because the bolt now is not subject to rotation. When it's clamped tightly inside the rod end bearing, again, moving the rod end, the bolt will not move when it's properly tightened down. Unlike, and I'll show you here an example, this is what's called a clevis end. Okay? In this particular piece, you can see the bolt will go through, and maybe there's a piece of metal that goes through there, or a cable with, a, with an end on it. But you can see that this bolt is always going to be subject to rotation. There is no bearing inside that clevis. Okay? So here we'll look at how we assemble the clevis. We don't have a rod end bearing that's going to fail, so we don't need a large area washer on either side of it. In this case, I'll show you how this would actually work. This would be a part like this. Maybe it's a cable, whatever it might be. We're going to put that through there. We're going to put this bolt through there. Sure, I am. Um, we'll put it in too far. We'll do it like this. Okay, there we go. And we'll add a washer to this side. And we're going to go ahead and put, again, the castellated nut on, run it up. Okay. And then these don't need to be torqued down real tight. Okay. You want it somewhat tight. Okay. You're going to line it up with a hole and then use cotter key in there. All right. So this cotter key will go through. Well, we're having a hard time here just lining it up. But bottom line is this. The cotter key goes through and then just bend the cotter key up and back across the nut. You can see that this bolt is subject to rotation. So this whole combination could actually rotate in there, hence the requirement for the castellated nut and the cotter key. Now, one other thing I want to show you here, clevis ends as well as rod end bearings. Let me show you this rod end bearing. You'll notice a little tiny hole in them. So what's that all about? So that hole is to make certain that we insert the, the threaded rod in far enough so that we have good force, good strength there, okay? So what you do there is you screw it in, you take yourself a piece of 32,000 safety wire, and the objective is you can't put, get the safety wire through there so we know we're up far enough. If we're not up far enough, you'll see that the safety wire will go through, okay? So that works on, on both of these with a the little, okay, that one we're in far enough. You can see if we back it out, eventually the safety wire will go through. There we go. So we want to turn that in far enough so the safety wire won't go through. Now, every once in a while, some of you are going to go home and look at a rod end bearing. Some of these cheaper knockoff rod end bearings don't have the hole in them. So what do you do? What I would encourage you to do is at least run it up halfway. So put yourself a mark either with a, with a pen or something just right on your threaded rod and run, so you get it in at least halfway up inside. Okay. So that'll work. Then, yep, it's all about the jam nut, right? So what we want to do once we get this rod end bearing tight or the clevis, the clevis on the threaded thing will have the same thing is you want to run this rod end jam nut here all the way up so it's locked into position. And then you're going to take two different size wrenches usually. In this case, a 5 16 works on this rod end, and then the 3 8 right there to tighten the rod end. Then use some cross check, as you can see here. Let's look at this one. You see, I put some cross check right across this, so then it makes for quick visual inspections down the road to make certain the gem nut or the rod end bearing have not come loose. Okay, here's a completed assembly to look at. Look at that, this one is loose. Okay, so here's a male threaded rod. So you're not going to have a hole on the male threaded rods on your uh, whatever you're assembling to. So again, what I'll do is use the jam nut as a halfway thread marker and then screw it in all the way up to that jam nut. And then align this as we showed you earlier to make certain it's not rubbing and then lock that jam nut down and use some cross check again.
Okay. So every once in a while, a rod end might need some maintenance. What you want to do, uh, normal condition inspections. I'll use some LPS two or three or even some ACF, and I'll lubricate the rod, the bearing inside the rod end there. Okay. There's some tools you can buy as well, like this one, that allow you to force grease into the rod end bearing. So this goes on here, seals like this. Push that down, tighten it down, and then use a grease gun right there, and you'll just pump grease till it'll want to come out the rod end bearing there. So, but in order to do that, you end up taking your fittings off of the aircraft or off the engine. It's just a little bit harder. I find the liquid uh, um, lubricants work just fine with those. For some clarity, what we're going to do is reassemble a rod end, much like we did the clevis end to show you here. So here would be an arm that it would be typically attached to. Again, take your bolt with a large area washer. This goes through the rod end bearing. I want to put the little washer on there first. Okay, so we've got a stack there that goes through the rod end bearing. Again, we can see we've got movement all around with no contact. Then we're going to put on our control arm. This is simulating a throttle arm or a mixture arm or something. So what we'll do is put the little washer on there again to give us clearance from the rod end bearing. Then put the piece on, and then we'll follow up there with just a little washer, the regular AN960 washer. And again, if it's the engine compartment, we would end up using a heat nut. If it's anywhere else, like on the aileron linkage, we will use a fiber nut. In this case, I've got the tool set up to show you. What we're going to do is tighten this one down. I'm going to use a 3-8 socket and a 3-8 wrench here. And normally you would just use your normal torque settings for uh, 3 16 bolts. Here we're just going to tighten it to demonstrate something here. We're going to run this all the way down tight. Okay. What I want to show you is that see how the bolt now moves very nice and freely inside that rod end bearing. The rod end is actually turning with the bolt. I know what some of you are thinking, oh, that bolt's rotating. Why don't we have a castellated nut on there or the cotter key? The reality is, if you look very closely, the bolt is not rotating. See how it stays in place with the washer and the nut? So the bolt here is not rotating. So we can use, as I mentioned, the fiber nut or a heat nut. Make certain you use the right length. Here you can see we've got a couple of threads showing. We can at least catch a fingernail. So we want, you know, two to three threads there showing at the end. So there's your control all assembly. You can see it works very nicely there. So hopefully that answers all your questions on rod end bearings. All right, I don't have quite my Smokey the Bear uniform on or my hat. But what we're going to do is spend a little bit of time talking about fire extinguishers because we've had some problems here lately. Quite honestly, we had a friend who just lost his RV-10 after only owning it for a month. They had an intake fire on the ground, luckily, and uh, put it out with a fire extinguisher. Unfortunately, it was the wrong kind of fire extinguisher, and it caused a lot of damage to the aircraft, uh, long-term damage. So the aircraft ended up being totaled, so an RV-10 there. So let's talk about the different kinds of fire extinguishers and the ones that you want to have near your airplane and what you don't want near your airplane. So you go into the most of the aisles at Home Depot or Walmart or something, what you're going to see are most likely the two fire extinguishers right here in front of me. The most common one that you see in your home is what's called an ABC fire extinguisher. Ah, why is it ABC? Well, look at this. It's for wood, it's for liquids, and it's for electrical fires, okay? So this you can use at home, in the hangar, in the hangar. Okay, so not on airplanes. Why? This puts out a corrosive powder. It's a very, very fine powder. It's a byproduct of how this fire extinguisher works. And it's almost like fiberglass dust. For those of you who've done any sanding with fiberglass, it actually looks like fiberglass sanding powder. It's extremely corrosive, especially to metal. And what happens if you use this on your aircraft is that dust will get everywhere inside the structure, inside the avionics, inside the engine, and just corrode it. And we're going to show you some still pictures in this video to actually help you see the damage that's been done. 
But I've actually been witness now to two to three airplanes where ABC fire extinguishers were used and the airplanes required totaling the aircraft. Really, really sad, okay? So this should only be hung inside your hangar on the wall, used inside the hangar if you have a, you know, a welding fire or electrical fire in your hangar. We do not have this near the doors of the hangar. What you want to have perhaps near the door of the hangar is one of two kinds of fire extinguishers. So the large one here is what's called a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. Typically, there's no residue left over from this fire extinguisher. It's just CO2. It helps extinguish the fire by eliminating the oxygen. Okay? These, are, they make a lot of noise when they extinguish and a big cloud, okay? but they're somewhat safe to use around aircraft. It's also very heavy and big, okay? So unless you've got an airplane and you want to give this to your passenger and say, hold on to this, they're not very practical inside the cockpit of an airplane. So what do we use? The next size, and this is a typical size that we'll use in a small two-seat aircraft and even the RV-10, is called a Halon fire extinguisher. Now, Halon is used uh, a lot inside data centers. Why is that? It's, it's non-corrosive at all. All it is is a gas. There's no residue, um, and it actually just depletes the air of oxygen. The fire goes out immediately. Uh, they're somewhat pricey, so I'm not going to show you how it works. You can Google Halon fire extinguishers, and you can actually see some demonstrations out there. They work really, really nicely. We recommend you have one of these inside your airplane. We have them in all of our aircraft, and maybe even one in the hangar, although in the hangar you can use the CO2 fire extinguisher something happens to your aircraft right outside the hangar. These typically come with some mounting. We'll put them either uh, uh, in front of the seat, on the tunnel, or right behind the rear seat. You want to be able to get to this. Um, you know, in 45 years of flying, I, I had one intake fire and jumped out of the cockpit and used this, and it was immediate, so uh, with no damage. Um, so I'd recommend you have a Halon fire extinguisher. So in summary, again, no ABC fire extinguishers used on aircraft. Carbon dioxide's okay. Halon is the best. And you can find these at all the supply houses like Aircraft Spruce. And uh, I haven't looked at Home Depot lately to see if they carry them. But. So isn't the Halon toxic in the cockpit? Yes, it is. So it's uh, the same reason why it will put out a fire. That's a great question. Uh, it will, you won't be able to breathe. So <laughs> the oxygen is gone from the air. So what you want to do if you actually do use one of these inside the cockpit is get, get to the, you know, the windows or get it ventilated rapidly. Okay. There you go. Again, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year from Base Leg Aviation. Mm -hmm.